We recently commemorated World Schizophrenia Day, which was a day on which I reflected about schizophrenia and my experiences with it in 30 years in recovery. I'm one among many people who are now in recovery from schizophrenia, and we are living proof that with loving family support, good quality, science-based early medical care, and continued involvement in activities that are meaningful, one can live a full and fulfilling life, even with a serious mental health diagnosis like that. With us today is a young man uh, whose, whose story we're going to tell. In fact, over 100,000 young Americans develop psychotic illness each year, and every one of their stories is unique. But um, one of those unique stories we're going to hear more about today. I'm Brandon Staglin, and this is One Mind Brainwaves. And I want to thank you, dear viewers, for being with us today to, to watch and participate in this webcast. Hope you'll be inspired and find value in it. If you have any questions for our guests during the webcast, feel free to ask them at any time. Later on, our team at One Mind Cyber Guide will review an app that can help you develop your cognitive skills called Cognifit by training your brain and engaging its neuroplasticity. But first, with us today is Dr. Paula Waddell, who is the medical director of the early psychosis programs at UC Davis as well as a young man who was a patient of Dr. Waddell, who I mentioned earlier, Chris Ferrari, whose inspiring recovery we'll hear more about today, and his mom, Deanna ferrari Leong. They are the stars of a documentary short film recently released by One Mind, produced by the amazing award-winning team at Alpheus Media, called Looking Brighter, Surviving Psychosis. Here now is that video for you to enjoy. All right, let's do it. Put this thing on. Having schizophrenia for me was very scary. Uh, I want to make sure that I didn't mess up your mic. It didn't fall, but I just didn't know if I touched any buttons or something. Totally good. I'm fine. Okay, I just hear you loud and clear. Cool. Okay, I'm ready. Slate. Okay, marker. At first, when I started hearing things that weren't really happening, started in college, I would hear people say, admit that stuff that didn't make any sense to me. Why is this happening to me? I couldn't go to college anymore. When he came home, we were all seated here in the den. All of a sudden, Christopher had said, uh, stop saying those things, Mom, and I hadn't said anything. I wanted to stay away from people. It got to the point where I didn't even really trust anyone or myself. I spent time on my laptop reading anything that I could read on schizophrenia. It's like the worst diagnosis one can have, you know, as far as mental illnesses. I read so much that, you know, my husband would say, you didn't sleep at all last night, did you? One in five adults has a mental health diagnosis. Oftentimes, families just don't know what to do. They're looking for guidance. They're looking for support. We're at the UC Davis Medical Center campus. We provide psychiatry, that's my role, but also primary care, therapy. We have a very robust research program as well. I love working in an academic environment because it pushes us to do better. We are always trying to push care forward all the time. We have a very close tie between our clinical work and our research. We want to develop new treatments and train the next leaders in the field. Psychosis is a really broad term and it really just refers to a set of symptoms. Things like hallucinations, hearing things that aren't really there. Prior to the 50s, we didn't really have antipsychotic medication. There was this tendency to use institutions, involuntary hospitalizations. There was a concerted effort to deinstitutionalize. And I think outpatient treatment models like ours are part of that solution. 
I understand you were referred to our program by your primary care doctor. Yeah. Your primary care doctor had talked to you about some of the troubles you were having with your thoughts. Yeah, my mom was the one who really started noticing it. When we see someone for the first time, we take a lot of time to really listen to the client and the family's story. We take a diagnosis of psychosis very seriously. And so we like to have different members of the team hear the client's story so that we develop a treatment plan that's best for them. You know, I'm seeing things like it's, it's kind of I saw that UC Davis had a program. And I think that's when I just felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. And then the chore was convincing Chris that he needed to do this. Hi, Dr. Waddell. Hi, Chris. How are you doing today? Doing great, doing great. Uh, same, same as always, uh, trying to make the best of everything. What have you been up to? We actually got new animals. Oh, yeah? Tw twin sheep. Oh. Yeah, now we have more animals chickens, ducks. At first, I was skeptical, but Dr. Waddell put me on some medication that actually helped me out more. How have you been feeling overall? My hallucinations are usually hallucinations that make me feel good, never negative. They're usually always positive. I started to see differences. It got better and better driving back and forth, going to therapy every week, and going to his doctor visit once a month. Yeah, they got pretty big for It wasn't until after about a year and a half of doing this where I think the light bulb went off in Chris's mind that this is a good thing, that what we're doing is, is positive, and that, that made me feel good. Our treatment program aims to include family members, and we really look at that term broadly. Whoever is seen as a support person, we absolutely could not do what we do without the family support. Here I have people that know that I'm hard to deal with sometimes, and they're cheering me up, they accept me, that's a lot. Oh my goodness. The treatments we have, that includes medications that can decrease the frequency or sometimes eliminate the symptoms. Okay. Similarly to cancer or diabetes, there's medications you get to help treat those illnesses. And with those medications sometimes come side effects. The positives of taking the medications outweigh the negatives of what the side effects are. She's right. What's it called? Tertiary Tar tardive discontinuation. Yeah, movement of the mouth. What's nice about our interactions with Dr. Waddell is she'll ask me if I've noticed anything, and so I can give her my thoughts on it. We use a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy, and that really teaches our clients how to cope with what they're dealing with towards yeah. health. How's the backyard? Actually, it's, it's come a long way. Yeah? Yeah, a lot of work. For Chris, going outside is a really important wellness activity, and it's one that I talk about a lot. Getting outside, being physically active. It gives them a purpose, yeah, a purpose and a routine. Eventually, we're working towards him possibly having a job. For Chris, success changes based on what he's hoping for. There's not one answer, and we're constantly figuring that out. I'm already at a point now where I know what I have to do, help out my family, do the important things, and the good stuff will come later down the line. I thought when it first happened, it was never gonna get better. I guess this is how it's gonna be. And as I started, Going through the process, things started looking brighter at the end of the tunnel. Mom was eager for services. Everyone deserves their chance at happiness, and we want to help our clients achieve their goals. It might be college or getting married and having children.
And those are all outcomes we see in the young people we work with. People can absolutely get better who have psychosis. Chris got back into college and he did get his degree in liberal arts. I think the stigma is that people with mental illness, it's a shameful, and it's not, it's a disease. I think Chris is normal, but it, it takes a lot of work, um, perseverance, um, time. With all that he goes through, he wakes up every morning and he gives 110% and he perseveres through everything. And he usually sees the best in everybody. He's kind of like my hero, yeah. Okay, Dr. Paula Waddell, Chris Ferrari, and Deanna Ferrari Leong, thank you so much for being with us today on Brainwaves. Thank you thank for you. having me. Thank you. Absolutely. Can't wait to hear more about your story and share it with our viewers. And viewers, again, feel free to post questions for our guests at any time during the webcast. So, Chris, uh, let me start with you, okay? Sounds good. All right. Up and Adam, as we saw, as we saw in the film, your first episode with schizophrenia occurred when you were college age. How did you first notice that changes were taking place in your mental health? I noticed that when I started, I would walk by people, even people that I didn't know, and I was hearing statements, and I, I didn't know what to make of it or what they meant to to my walk of life that I was going through there at the time. I was just trying to go to college, learn, have fun. But I started hearing a lot of voices of totally different things that I didn't know what to make of it. And slowly it was hurting me every day. It sounds scary. Like you never experienced anything like that before. You didn't know, didn't know what to make of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. That, that does sound scary. Um, and, and Deanna, you know, no one is born knowing how to take care of someone who's experiencing schizophrenia or another serious mental illness. Uh, what was the changes in Chris taking place when you noticed that? What was that like for you? And how did you feel at the time? Well, I, you know, I was concerned for Chris as a mother. I was scared. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't know enough about it. So I, I really, it was kind of hard for me to, to kind of wrap myself around it and to, uh, you know, try and help them as best I could at the time. I, I really, you know, uh, I was kind of at a loss um, and uh, scared, very scared. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I was trying, you know, and I was trying to, you know, figure out what was going on with Chris at the time. Yeah, I can imagine how confusing it might have been for you at the time. Um, I remember when, when I was diagnosed, my mom and dad were, were scared too. And, and they, they tried to do research on what schizophrenia was, but I, you did the same thing, didn't you? You talk about that in the film. And how, how did you navigate that, that process of finding the right care for Chris and, right. and finding UC Davis and Dr. Waddell? Right. Well, I think the first thing that I did was I just kind of poured myself into, um, you know, going on my laptop and just um, going through anything and everything about schizophrenia, trying to learn as much as I could. And then when I, once I kind of absorbed all that, I decided, okay, now I've got to do something with all this information. And so I decided to look for programs that dealt with schizophrenia. And I've always been a proponent for research. And so I kind of went down that path to see um, what was being done as far as research and if we could get Chris into a research program. Um, and of course, I needed to talk to Chris about it and, you know, and, and get his buy-in into all of this. But I thought that that would be the best way, um, you know, to help with anything we could do as far as his illness. And so we happened to find, um, you know, UC Davis 
and that was, you know, fairly close to where we live. And so I just made, you know, one day I just made the phone call and I remember speaking to the person that I spoke to and I kind of shared our story with her and she, you know, basically said that she wanted to see Chris and, you know, at that point, I didn't even know whether, you know, we would be included in the program or, you know, what it involved, but it was almost like a weight was lifted off my shoulder, just knowing that, you know, that we were reaching out and then there was somebody there to listen to us. Wow. The must, yeah, it must've been a kind of a, a relief to know that there, there was help and that it kind of involved research, involved this kind of state-of-the-art care that can come from the research and uh, that possibility gave, gave you some hope, I imagine. Right. Oh, we did very much so. Yeah, that's great. Paula, your programs at UC Davis and your outpatient treatment models are very forward thinking based in, in the latest science and, and, and innovative. Um, what are the components that have made this program so successful so far? Yes, I think, you know, it's hard to just identify only a few things. I think there's so many pieces that come together to create the treatment program that we have. One of them is the research side of our program, which Deanna just mentioned. We have a really robust research program and really close relationships between the research side and the clinical side. So we're able to translate what's happening in real time into our treatment programs. And I think that really keeps us forward thinking and as innovative as we possibly can be. And then we take a team-based approach. So it's not just one person, it's multiple people who are working together, who bring different perspectives, different ideas. Um, So you're really not limited to just one provider. You've got an entire team behind that person. And whether or not um, our families are interfacing with every person on the team, you know, that team is always in the background, always supporting each and every provider in our program to be the best that we possibly can. So I think it's, uh, if I had to focus in on a couple of things, it would be those. And then finally, really being recovery oriented, really focused on meaningful goals that resonate with the families and young people we're working on. That's our focus. It's not about um, stopping every symptom. It's about creating a meaningful and fulfilling life for each individual, however that looks. That sounds perfect. I mean, working with each individual to know like what matters to them and help them get to what matters to them, uh, what could be better than that. Mm-hmm. And, and this, this care model that you implement there at UC Davis, it's, um, I believe it's called coordinated specialty care and it's something that is available in different places around the US. So families who are watching this might be able to access a similar program where they are. To, is that right? Yes, that's right. We're seeing an expansion of these efforts. Um, so we're very excited to see that happening. Fantastic. But uh, UC Davis is a leader in this area, definitely. Um, so, and Chris, in the film, you say you were skeptical at first of, I guess, of the care that you might be getting at, at UC Davis. Why, why was that? Because I, w- I had uh, some situations where people reached out and it wasn't really helping. But I said, you know what, with everything my mom and dad have done for me, and I said, why not see if this works? And like my mom said, through the doctors prescribing me medication that really leveled me out and going through research programs with people that were very nice, very, 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 very nice. And they were never they would never get you in a, in a moment where you felt, you know, out of yourself and you always felt calm. And like my mom said, within a year to a year and a half, and like she said in the video, I actually really enjoyed all my times going up to UC Davis and making it work out. I think if I can add just from a mother's perspective, um, Chris was at an age where, you know, he didn't want to be told that he had an illness and um, that type of an illness. And so I think that had a lot to do with it as far as, you know, his feelings of, of how he was experiencing it. But I think through just perseverance and time, like we had uh, said in the video that, you know, it it actually was about a year and a half where, 
you know, we were driving back one day and he said, you know, mom, this is, this is really good. I, I'm really happy that I'm here and I'm doing this. And it was just like, wow, that made me feel so good. <laughs> I can't even describe <laughs> in words how, how that made me feel. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's and wonderful. Yeah. And also to get the support group, the many support groups I would always go to, you hear everyone's walk of life. And sometimes it puts it in perspective that there's so many people going through what you're going through and just hearing that and going home and knowing that you're not the only one makes a difference. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yeah. That, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's wonderful. You were able to, to get that, that kind of um, engagement with other people, you know, experiencing similar things. And um, we probably found that you had things in common with them that, that, um, that you know, helped you adapt what you're going through yourself, you know, just and change that. and change some things I was going through at the time. Fantastic. Uh, they probably offered insights too, from their experience, you could adapt it on, on your own and vice versa. I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Paula, how do you develop a targeted care plan? How do you work with people like Chris in their, in their care uh, and what, what is that like for the people in the care as you develop that care plan with them? Yeah, it starts with listening. It's a lot of listening because it takes a while to get to know somebody, to understand their context, their family, and what their goals are. So it really has to start there. We can't come up with a treatment plan based on a diagnosis. It's really based on life goals and on what is in interesting and um, exciting to the people we're working with. So it really starts with a whole lot of listening and patience. It takes time to get to know somebody, and we have to earn that trust. We have really difficult conversations, and uh, it takes a while, I think, for anybody to be able to open up and share some of these challenging details it's hard to talk about. So that takes time and patience. And then we think about, again, everything is sort of in reference to a goal. And so we think about sort of top priorities, what somebody wants kind of in the here and now. Let's, let's get you some wins early on. Let's think about that. And then always sort of thinking about the long-term goal as well and trying to build slowly towards that. Hmm. Wow, it sounds wonderful. And the you're talking about how um, it's a lot of listening and understanding, building that trust. I remember when I was diagnosed, I didn't trust my psychiatrist farther than I could throw him, so to speak. The first one that I met, and it took me a while to find one that I could actually interact and feel comfortable with. And, and yeah, it's hard to talk about um, experiences like that when you don't, and they're so out of the ordinary, they're so unusual and scary. I mean, did, did you find that too, Chris, when you started? Uh, I found that it wasn't necessarily the doctors that were the problem. It was me opening up. Like my mom said, for the first year, I was convinced that I didn't, that I was all right. I was just saying to myself, I'll, ha I'll just deal with it and, and think myself, not in, in a, basically say to myself, I'm a man, I can climb out of this one. but that's not the way you go about it when you have mental illness you should address it the best way possible with people that are that that have knowledge that have background in the in this in this stuff to help you climb out of it because they know they kind of know a bit more about brain activity and the way these illnesses work than i could ever imagine yeah, that's a great perspective to know to know what you don't know, <laughs> to have that humility to, to know to get the help that you can, can that you need. Um, fantastic. And Deanna, when Chris began to see Dr. Waddell and started the treatment regimen, you say you saw that transformation in Chris about a year and a half in, and uh, you saw Chris changing uh, ideally for the better. And um, what uh, how did Chris's changes change your relationship with Chris? Wow. Um, I think that um, because I was seeing positive changes, our, you know, our relationship, which had been, you know, somewhat of a touchy relationship during that year and a half, um, you know, started to be kind of what, 
it was prior to Chris coming, you know, uh, the insidu- sinu- insidious nature of that illness, you know, coming, appearing, um, you know, it was back to where we were before. More controlled. Yeah. Well, no, we would just, you know, we're able to communicate um, and, you know, um, just have good relationships. Um, as opposed to, you know, us kind of, you know, I think we had more empathy for each other, um, or I had more empathy for him. Um, and it just, I don't know, we, our relationship just seemed better. We were able to talk to each other. Not only did it get better, but I also noticed that through the medication, I developed more of a routine where I could get stuff down in the out in the public life, but when it came down to here, I can wake up in the morning, get my morning going with medication and my coffee and start my day and figure things out. Like I mentioned that out, out and about work and do things to a, a science. And I don't think I'd be there with that, without that medication. Yeah, we were able to do things together. You know, I we're very social people. And so it was nice to have, and I always want to include, you know, Chris in everything. And, at, you know, at first he didn't want to do that. Yeah. And so after, you know, having the treatment plan with Dr. Waddell and the medications, Chris was more um, comfortable going out and doing things with us and participating in, in all of our, you know, events that we do or, or, you know, life events. Exactly. So that, that made me feel better. Cause I, you know, I, I don't want him feeling like he's left, sec- out. left out or secluded. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was very nice. You guys have a great close relationship. I can tell. And it's wonderful to hear how it kind of got even more strong and deep, you know, um, as, as Chris started to reco- recover from the his first episode like that. And, um, and I, go ahead. It was easier for us then to talk to each other about what he was feeling too, you know, um, and we would sit and talk about it and kind of work through things sometimes, you know, if he was having a difficult day, it was easier to talk to him about it. So I, you know, all the way around, it was, it was, it was a pot. It's a, it's been a positive experience Good. and it continues to be one. Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. And Paul, you talk in the film about how critical it is for families to have a bond like that and support one another in these, these challenging times of, of serious mental illness when someone's sick. And, uh, but how important is it to get early care? How important is early intervention for someone's ultimate recovery? Yes, it's really important. So, you know, it's a bit of common sense that the longer something goes untreated, the more challenging the treatment will become. And we certainly see that in psychosis. And it ends up being one of the most important predictors of how well somebody will go on to do. So the longer somebody goes without treatment, unfortunately, the more difficult their symptom course tends to be. And we've seen this time and time again. And so it becomes a very important treatment target for the coordinated specialty care programs, any early psychosis program trying to shorten that period of, of um, delay, any delay in treatment, you know, because it has important implications for long-term functioning. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, so that, that's really important to, to note. Uh, I had a similar experience as well. And uh, I, I'm glad that uh, Deanna, when you researched UC Davis, it, d- it didn't take you too long to, to find uh, help because they were there, they were available and you could get some care there for Chris. Yeah. So uh, today's topic is early psychosis care. And we're talking with Dr. Paula Waddell, psychiatrist and medical director of the early psychosis programs at UC Davis. And also joining us is a promising young man who's one of her patients, Chris Ferrari, and his mom, Deanna Ferrari Leong. And viewers, thank you for watching and being part of this webcast with us. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comment section at any time. And if you are finding benefit from what you're learning in this webcast today, please share it with other people who you know. They, they may find some use in it as well uh, for their loved ones or themselves. So, Paula, ongoing management of symptoms of serious mental illness can be complicated. Uh, and, and side effects of medications vary from person to person, but they, they can be troublesome. So, for example, what is tardive dyskinesia and how, how prevalent is it for people who experience these conditions and take antipsychotic medications? 
Sure. So tardive dyskinesia is just a fancy way of referring to delayed onset abnormal movements. They're abnormal involuntary movements related to prolonged exposure to a medication that can induce them. So typically this is antipsychotics, though there are a few other medications out there that can do this as well, um, that have a similar mechanism of action. And it's hard to exactly quantify how many people will be affected by this particular side effect. Probably best guess estimate is around um, 20% of those who long-term are taking these medications will experience some form of it Although in my experience, the vast majority of the time, it doesn't end up being very um, distressing and doesn't impair functioning. That is, is actually quite rare. Good. And with side effects like that or other side effects, like, for example, drowsiness or restlessness or metabolic uh, you know, changes in weight gain, for example, how, how, what's a good way, what are good ways to reduce these side effects or mitigate them for somebody taking medications like this? So we always try to use the least amount of the medication necessary. So that's really the first step. So minimizing the medication whenever we can, that's always the goal. Then there are other medications that can help to manage some of those side effects. And then a lot of lifestyle interventions where we talk about, in particular, weight management. So increasing physical activity, getting outside, being really active as Chris is, does such a wonderful job of, and it's an inspiration, I think, to many. Thank you. And I'll just add that, you know, weight gain is so difficult. And I don't think modern medicine has really come up with a very good solution to this. So I think that's, you know, yes, it's a side effect of the, the antipsychotic medication for sure. Um, but it's also a side effect of um, modern life. So I think it's <laughs> one that, that we all struggle with and, and modern medicine has not delivered us a good solution yet. Yeah, it's true. Uh, Chris, what has your experience been like taking medications and, and dealing with the side effects? You know, the side effects were not really that bothersome. In fact, I love food. But like Dr. Waddell said, if you if you want to eat and you, you put on weight, go outside, make some steps, plan a plan, run around, shoot some hoops, do be I do active. be active and your weight will go down. And you are pretty darn good at basketball. I saw you thinking, you know, dunk sinking uh, shot after shot on, and during the film. Oh, me, me and my brother love basketball. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. How often do you play? Well, we used for for a good amount of time. I think about a year and a half ago, we would play for three to four hours a day, every single day. <laughs> just make like 30 40 free throws in a row 20s in a row just make non-stop shots but because i'm like dr waddell said to be safe in the heat because of the medication mm -hmm. some of the side effects from certain meds that i take i've been taking a more different approach to how i handle myself working outside mm -hmm. as opposed to mowing lawns or helping my father out outside I try to do it in the early part of the day or towards night. And if I do have to work in the, during the day, I try to do it more inside work. So that way I don't get uh, uh, any of the side effect feelings. That's smart. Yeah. You know, when the best times to do outside work are for your, for your health. That's awesome. Exactly. And, yeah. And, and regarding all the different forms of, of care you get through UC Davis, the medication, the psychotherapy, I imagine is part of it as well. And uh, other, other things you do it through UC Davis. Are there certain parts of that care that you feel benefit you the most? And, and if so, in what ways? I would say the medicine, because before I started taking medicine, and I don't know if I ever told uh, Dr. Adele this, but there'd be times when I couldn't sleep. And I was going crazy. Sometimes my dad would would wake up at 4.30 in the morning and come downstairs and see me on YouTube. And my dad probably looked at me like, Chris, go get some sleep. But I had so many problems. And it, 
it wasn't easy. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I, I got, I got, I basically got from the medication. I developed a good period of rest from the time I take it to the time it kicks in. I got better, better situated time rest. And I got much more calm and I got much more down to earth and the ability to go to big functions without being too much anxiety. I basically felt a whole lot better through the course of time. Awesome. And, you know, medication is often um, people might be afraid of medication due to side effects or just due to feeling like they might be not really like in command of their mind if they're taking medication. I think that's what kind of gets a bad rap for reasons it shouldn't. Um, cause it can make great, be a great help for so many people with, with mental health challenges. I mean, I take medication myself and, um, it has made huge differences for my own mental health and changes in the way I can relate to people. You know, I I'm with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, if I could add, I think one of the things I see is people expressing to me, I want to do this on my own. I want to, um, this sort of false idea that somehow that would be a strong thing to do. And I always try to evoke the image of a person with asthma who is like running the mile and is struggling to breathe. And would you withhold their inhaler and say, no, no, you have to do this on your own while they collapse and, you know, can't breathe and can't get oxygen no, of course not. That would be terrible. We give them their inhaler so they can run the mile and build their muscles and 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 do all the things they want to do. So I think it's really important to put medication in that context. It's certainly not the only part of treatment for sure, but it is an important part and it can be very helpful. For sure. Definitely. And Deanna, what is uh what has Christmas Chris's treatment been like for you? Have there been any surprises? Well, I think for me, it, they've all only been positive surprises. You Most know, of the they, time. Well, no. Most of the yeah. time. They, they, Sometimes they, I get on their bad side. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they, they've been nothing but positive experiences that we've had. So I, I'm, you know, very happy and fortunate that Chris has been able to be in this program and to, you know, be afforded all the, the, the treatment plan and, you know, that, they've given us for Chris, um, nothing but positives and, and good surprises. Yeah. <laughs> That's great to hear. Mm-hmm. And uh, Paula, the, the fear that surrounds these illnesses goes beyond just fear of medication. There's fear of, you know, there's a stigma we talk about when we talk about mental health and people might be afraid of people who they meet who they don't know who have, they find out have a serious mental illness. What do you talk? How do you talk to people to help them, understand serious mental illness and, and maybe lessen the stigma they might experience? Yes. Um, we have to be honest with ourselves about the stigma that's out there. There's lots of really great efforts that we see all around us now sort of trying to decrease stigma. But the reality is that every day we are all kind of steeped in this culture of stigma associated with mental illness. It happens all the time when it's sort of used as an insult or it's used in passing commentary. Sometimes I hear it, you know, from comedians or from the news and it's it's really everywhere. And we are all absorbing that at all times. So we have to be really honest with ourselves that that stigma is out there. And the important thing is to confront it and talk about it to get it out into the open, to acknowledge that it continues to pop up in our lives all the time, and to do things like this, you know, different activities that help to educate people about what's really going on. I think there's just a lot of uh, unknown about it, and and then a lot of fear, you know, people struggle to try um, and understand it, and and fear things like this happening to them. But we can decrease that through efforts to, to bravely share stories. Mm. And I think, yeah, she's so right on with all of that because, you know, historically, if you look back on other diagnoses like um, seizure disorders, you know, in the past they were, uh, you know, people that had seizures were stigmatized and thought of as different 
and, you know, with education and, you know, more, uh, more discussion about it, you know, it's, it's, it's not as stigmatized as it used to be. And I think this is the same for, for, you know, schizophrenia and other illnesses. And exactly, the more education, the more we talk about it, and the more, you know, that um, people that are in the media, you know, ex expose it in a positive way, I think that would be very helpful. Yeah, and sharing stories is really powerful to help dispel mm -hmm. stigma, because when you understand somebody and where they're coming from, what they've been through, um, they're human to you. If they weren't before, they should be, but they, they are. And you can see that and the beauty and the meaning in, in their stories. And um, I think that just stomps stigma really, really well in mm -hmm. people's minds. Um, but do you also find that people share their stories with you when you share their sto your story with them? Oh, most definitely. In fact, you know, um, I've had people come up to me that know about us and, you know, they will share their stories with their loved ones. And so then, you, you know, you, you get to that point where you know that you're not alone. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, and at first, sometimes you're not really comfortable sharing the story, but as time goes on, you do become more comfortable. And I'm glad that, you know, and that was another, I guess, surprise for me is that, um, you know, getting out of my comfort zone um, or um, as far as sharing the information with everybody. So I, I appreciate the fact that you, you and UC Davis kind of pushed me into this to, you know, get out of my little zone and, and, and share this because I really do want to do that. So thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. And Chris, thank you too for sharing your story. I mean, it's, it's helping many people really, really appreciate that. No problem. For sure. <clears throat> So, Deanna, what words of encouragement do you have or advice for families who are, have loved ones struggling with schizophrenia or other serious mental illnesses? Um, well, first of all, is become educated in it. You know, we, there's so. Um, I guess we're fortunate in this um, this age and time that you know we have you know laptops. We have the ability to go online and and to you know get all this education. So, become educated. Um, um, you know, uh, and, and what you had uh, alluded to earlier is make sure that if, you know, your family member needs help, that you get the help as quickly as possible. Don't wait. Um, and I think to me, that's, that's the most important part is reach out, ask for help. You know, don't, don't feel um, less than, you know, uh, asking for help. Just, just make that phone call um, and, and, ha and seek treatment. That's great. And, and Chris, do you have any words of encouragement for people experiencing uh, schizophrenia or other serious conditions like that? Yeah. From my point of view, what I went through, I don't want to wish upon my worst enemy. And I'm saying if things are changed mentally in your life, get help. Because like you guys were saying earlier in this, in this video, it's never too late, but tackling it as soon as possible can actually help you out, get better even faster. But this, all this stuff, the stigma, it's, it's all around. But from my personal opinion, if it weren't for UC Davis, I don't know where I'd be. So if you need help, get the help. Words, fantastic words. Thank you, Chris. And I hope people will heed them. So, and finally, and Chris, uh, you finished your college degree. That is awesome. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And where are you at today? Uh, how, how are you doing in your life? And where do you want to see your life go in the years to come? Uh, honestly, what I would, what I, I would like to be there for my family at the moment. Like I have been, I take much enjoyment helping my dad out because he's always been there for me. Even as a very, very young child, he's always took me places. We, I had a lot of fun with him. I would just like to help out my grandma, my mom, my dad, my cousins. And in the future, I don't know what it holds. Th things could change, but I would like to just stick to the program at UC Davis and do what my family wants me to do at the, at the moment. That's basically what I see us right now. Awesome. Yeah. Family comes first is a model my family has too. 
I'm totally with you there. Beautifully there for your family. And I'm sure Deanna and your dad appreciate that too. <laughs> you do a lot. So finally, we like to wrap with a lightning round. Five rapid fire questions. I want each of you to give me quick answers. One person at a time for all of the uh, questions. So uh, we'll start with first Deanna okay. and then Chris. <laughs> and then after Chris is done, we'll go to Paula. You guys feel ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. This will be fun. So um, Deanna, you first. Here we go. What type of music or song do you turn to when you're feeling down? Uh, unwritten by uh, Natasha Benningfield. Yeah, that's an inspiring <laughs> song. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Uh, working on projects, um, you know, like uh, refinishing furniture, getting involved in things. I, I tend to do that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Are there certain people or dog, cat or other animal that help you through bad days? Yes. Um, my immediate family, my husband, my mother, Chris, uh, my dog muffin um and also inspiring people people mm -hmm. that i've put on my little positive checklist <laughs> there <laughs> great to have role models uh -huh. definitely and you are a role model for many people now as well so <clears throat> is there a hobby or activity you pursue to help you relax and unwind and cope with stress mm. uh Oh gosh. Uh, oh God, this is supposed to be a lightning round. Um, I, <laughs> I, I think um, at the activity would be actually we um, donate our time like to um, the, um, the church. Um, so we've been active in um, the crab feed that we host every year um, and also other activities with the church. That's kind of what my hobbies are. As well as um, what other? Huh? Furniture. Well, I, I think I said refinishing furniture. I I've been doing that a lot lately. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. And then finally, what gives you hope? People. People give me hope. I you know especially during this time of COVID, I found that there's such a resiliency in people, and uh, we were all out there trying to help each other. Um, either you know uh, helping vaccinate people, getting the education out there. Um, as well as finding, uh, you know, a, a vaccine for it. Um, I think there's power in people, hope. Yeah, there's so much beauty in people and so much potential. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Deanna. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chris, it's your turn. You ready? Sure. Awesome. Okay. What type of music or song do you turn to when you're feeling down? I like all music, but usually the one that I like and I heard it a long time ago. Michael Jackson, You Are Not Alone. Oh, yeah. What a wonderful song. And he, yeah, he's a good one. Classic. Awesome. Yeah. What helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally? Uh, I don't really usually tell people always the truth upon this question. But I would say yeah. it's uh, hanging out with my dad and, my, and Matt, my brother, and uh, coping it's simple. The, the biggest one is just to go outside and shoot hoops, because if I'm successful, I'm ha I'm very happy with my play. And it makes me think about myself, how much more I can make the next day or what can I improve on? Sometimes I'll miss some shots, but when I get them going, it makes me feel better. I so love it. For fun. I love that. Yeah. Oh, that's that's so great. And then um, are there certain people or or dog, cat, or other animal that helps you through bad days? We have, uh, do all the dogs are, are very nice. I love all my dogs and my parents' dogs and my grandma's dog. I love uh, my personal cat that I take care of. Uh, her name is Brownie. I have a very strong relationship with her. We spend a lot of, of our time together, and I also feed her every day. Uh, the other cats eat separate, but I feed her because she's more of my 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 close friend. So I take care of her myself. <laughs> That's so great. Does she sit on your lap sometimes, or she does? In fact, it's very cute. What she does in the morning when she wants to wake me up for to get her friskies, she claws at my cheek and she'll claw at my lips, <laughs> and then I flip over 
so I can go back to sleep. But man, she gets me up early in the morning, every single morning. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best alarm clock i have a dog that does the same thing. exactly <laughs> fantastic and then what uh what is a hobby or activity that helps you unwind and feel calm two of them play and watch football and basketball and then i have to say watching racing on racing cars of all so sorts on youtube mm, cool and then what gives you hope uh family you have such a strong family beautiful deanna you're uh, excuse me um uh, paula your turn you ready yes okay what type of music or song do you turn to when you're feeling down i love to put on just some classical piano music helps me feel real calm okay what helps you cope when you're going through a tough time mentally Definitely exercise and silly TV shows. <laughs> Comedy, <laughs> anything that makes me laugh. Yeah, awesome. Are there certain people or a dog, cat, or other animal that helps you through bad days? Yeah, my, my family, my friends, and then my colleagues. I have such great colleagues to help me do this work. So I'm very fortunate to have uh, my team around me. Love it. Uh, what's a hobby or activity that helps you unwind and feel calm? One of my favorite things to do that I find so calming is stand up paddle boarding, which I have recently discovered on mountain lakes. I don't, the ocean is a bit much for me. It's a little too, <laughs> too rocky, but nice, calm mountain lake. Um, I love that. Yeah. You, you, if you fall, you get wet, they just climb right back on. That's fun too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what gives you hope? You know, if I had to pick a word, it would be science. I think this past year, um, science is our uh, MVP. <laughs> so, and it continues to be this, the scientific discoveries, the people working just day in, day out, um, trying to address these big issues and big problems. So I, I consistently feel inspired by science. Definitely. I do too. Uh, science gives me so much hope and, and seeing the kind of like innovations and, and care that can come out of science. Um, like you applied UC Davis and like Chris, like you've been a, a participant in and uh, combined with people's own resilience and the love of their families. I mean, it can really make a huge difference in people's lives. I want that to be a take home message that our, that our viewers understand today. So Deanna and Chris and Paula, thank you so much for being with us on brainwaves today. You've been wonderful. Um, and viewers, thank you too for watching, but stick around for a minute because we have a treat for you. Our team at One Mind Cyber Guide is going to review an app that help, can help you improve your cognitive skills, and it's called Cognifit. So uh, please watch. Hi, my name is Steven Schuler, and I'm the executive director of One Mind Cyber Guide. You probably already use your phone for many things throughout the day. But did you know that there are also apps to help you manage your mental health and well-being? There are literally thousands of mental health apps available for download today. And with so many choices to choose from, it can be hard to separate the good from the bad. That's where One Mind Cyber Guide can help. At One Mind Cyber Guide, we review apps on three different metrics, credibility, user experience, and transparency. We've reviewed over 200 products, and all of these reviews are available for free on our app guide at onemindcyberguide.org. If you're interested in using a mental health app and you already see a therapist, try working with them to find an app to integrate into your treatment. They may have their own recommendations for apps or may suggest ways to use an app to add on to the work you're doing in therapy. In the age of technology, it's still as important as ever to build connections and a community of support for mental health. Why not use apps as a starting point for conversations around mental health, just as you might suggest a helpful app to a friend who needs help with their time management, fitness tracking, or navigation. The more we normalize these conversations, the better chance we have of decreasing mental health stigma. Cognifit is a cognitive training program intended to help users improve brain functioning. By playing specially created games, users can address many core cognitive functions, including working memory, visual processing speed, and attention. The user is prompted to complete an initial 10-minute cognitive assessment, customizable for each user and their goals. Training programs range from targeting dyslexia, insomnia, or driving skills. 
Cognifit allows users to track progress over time and compare scores with those of others. It is intended to provide diverse programs suited for many users, not just those looking for remediation of cognitive difficulties. Cognifit scores highly on our credibility metric, receiving a score of 4.67 out of 5, highly on our user experience metric, receiving a score of 4.24 out of 5, and receives an acceptable score on our transparency metric around data security and privacy. We look forward to seeing you next week for another app review. Thank you, CyberGuide team. And thank you to Chris Ferrari, Deanna Ferrari-Leong, and Dr. Paula Waddell for being with us today on Brainwaves and sharing their insights with us. Viewers, thank you too. If you'd like to check out any of our past episodes, please visit onemind.org slash brainwaves or for more resources to learn about for helping with families with mental health challenges, visit onemind.org slash resources. And uh, please subscribe to our email newsletter on that page, either of those pages I just mentioned, uh, to keep up to date for all the Brainwaves webcasts we have coming down the line. And then finally, tune in next week for another episode in which I'll talk about my own journey with schizophrenia, and my dad will join me for a special Father's Day episode. Hope you'll tune in and see you then. Thanks, everyone. Take care. My mother has had depression uh, most of her life. My uncle committed suicide when he was in his 30s. I live with bipolar. Now more than ever, it's the world's leading cause of disability. Yet research to improve mental health lacks the attention physical health research receives. Visit OneMind.org. From the lab to the front lines, accelerating brain health for all. Help us fund new treatments at OneMind.org.